Well, I think we should start uh, because there's people waiting for having to catch planes and uh, et cetera. So first of all, thank you very much for, for, for staying here until the very end of this meeting. Uh, basically, what I would like to do now, I asked uh, uh, Phil Landrigan to help me given his experience in uh, a lot of uh, meetings and, uh, and wrapping up and doing uh, what, what has to be done after a meeting like this is, uh, is finished uh, in terms of the output of a meeting, what, what, what was discussed and what we want to do next. So basically, uh, one of the, let, let me tell you that, that the main aims of this meeting when we submitted a grant to NIHS and Anath, I, I thank you as, your, as a representative of this great organization and EPA too, uh, and all the others. I have to acknowledge all the other sponsors already did, but uh, thank you to everybody for the contribution. I think it was a successful meeting. I heard from everybody that they were, being, they were happy in these uh, uh, three and a half days. Uh, 19 years after the previous meeting in uh, Little Rock, so that's a long time uh, because it was in 1997. So I think uh, uh, I, I understand there's uh, more enthusiasm and more uh, sort of determination in having more meetings on manganese because actually what happens in these meetings is that you focus on one specific topic and you have a way to uh, discuss a lot of things with, uh, with colleagues and with the main experts and that, that doesn't really happen in a, within larger meetings like SOT or others where you, you're sort of a little distracted by other top topics. So here you have one and you sort of focus on that. So uh, we, we, had, we had aims for this meeting. The first aim was to have to convene international experts and researchers, researchers to present, discuss, evaluate all the new studies and evidence and the new research. So I think we accomplished that because I, I'm, I, I think we had a number of uh, very good, excellent presentation, new information, and I have still to reprocess all this, and uh, hopefully we can do it nicely in the, in the, few, in the next uh, days or weeks or months, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so very good uh, achievement of, uh, of new research and new data and new input from uh, many of you, and, uh, and so this is a good uh, achievement. Uh, the other aim was to was actually to uh, encourage and enhance communication, understanding, and collaboration. Uh, and these are kind of a formal terms to me, but very important nowadays, because if I think backwards, a lot of time and effort is actually not very well organized. We are kind of, uh, we don't optimize ourselves. We are busy with our grants, with our deadlines, that's for sure, that's what we have to do. But I think we should try to optimize a little bit better, uh, a little bit more what we can do in terms of communication with our peers, with our colleagues. Because that's a that's a strength. That's no question about it. Uh, the resource that we have by our internal networking is a major asset that we have, and that's very helpful to me to create and maintain and further develop this communication, understanding, and collaboration. And we included a lot of different components into this from uh, uh, clinicians, because clinicians have, they need to know what the diagnosis, how to do the diagnosis. They have cases, have, there are cases, not only in China. China is a huge problem. Well, there's there's uh, colleagues in Ahmed in China, they have silica, they have asbestos, they have manganism as cases. They have to deal with work compensation. So just to, there's no, unfortunately there's no, colleague from China here, but I know them and that, that's, I know that, that's, that, that that is definitely a big need for them. But not only in China, of course, there are cases and uh, I was talking to the colleague from the Netherlands and I know, I'm aware here sometimes, you know, there's all this issue for, for clinicians, but then basic scientists, clinical researchers, epidemiologists, toxicologists, experts in exposure sciences, special interest group, including industry, union representative, uh, risk assessor, regulatory expert for further understanding of magnetosity and prevention. So it's kind of inclusive uh, a concept of communication and collaboration. We wanted to do it like this. We, we, we had industry, we had unions at this scientific uh, forum, and we want to keep that approach. Uh, and I hope we all agree that that is an important approach because 
for our research, we want that our research has an impact in the society, so therefore we need stakeholders. We need industry, we need unions, we need uh, community group because we want to communicate and share our results and convince them that we need to do something in a certain direction. So that's, that's to me, the importance to have this, this, this other uh, component in, 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 at the table. Not a table, uh, it's gonna be something digital. <laughs> Anyways, uh, one of our aim was to create a network, electronic network, and we've done that. Uh, each one of you has a, a code because you're, you're registered, so you can access this website. The website has all the recording of the meeting, Within the website, there's going to be a menu with documents, and we will ask everybody to share whatever they want to share, posters, we can have a PDF, we can have any paper publication, etc. Everything in that place is going to be a, 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 um, is there's going to be a resource for the meeting participants. It's, it's not public, so that takes care of any other issue with sharing, because this is reserved for the participants at the meeting. But it's, I think it's going to be a, a nice way to try to keep this network alive, possibly, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that we can do what? Actually, one of the main object, objectives was to uh, synthesize all the new data and new research came, that, that came out of the meeting into something that's going to be a document. Uh, there's going to be a, 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 a volume of neurotoxicology as uh, special aims dedicated to this meeting with all the selected peer um, uh, review publication, but also one paper that I'm, of course, it's going to be a paper that uh, we can all be engaged in. I hope we can, we can be all engaged into this paper where we actually indicate the research needs for the future. That's going to be yeah. very important for funding agencies. That's going to be very important for uh, everybody who is willing and regulatory agencies to understand what the scientists think that we should do next. So that's, this, is the, this is what we want to do. We don't have to write the paper now. Of course, everybody's tired, and I think we should, uh, it's up to us if we want to keep this uh, uh, in a long discussions or not, uh, discussion or not, and, uh, but this is the idea. So we will ask your input today or in the next uh, days uh, to for what you think it's important to be considered in terms of new evidence. We have the new evidence, but, but please let us know. And, and actually all the proposal for uh, future research needs in all the things that we have, we have done in these days, uh, from basic science to epidemiology to uh, genetics to, uh, to dietary assessment, occupational versus uh, children. So everything that we have covered, I think we've covered almost everything I'm not sure, but uh, I think that uh, that uh, the coverage was quite uh, good, and so uh, I think that uh, that this is the idea. Yep. Phil, well, thank thank you, Roberto. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Roberto for his leadership, Roberto and his team for their collective leadership and having put this conference together and brought those two so many people together. And Carla and Renu did the most of this, so thank you. <laughs> Thank, thanks okay, to the, Thank you, Joan Kramer, too. She's not here. And to Joan, yeah, for, for having inspired the whole series of these of these annual meetings over the last 25 years. 28. Amazing. Quite amazing. Yeah. Secondly, um, thanks to the sponsors, NIEHS, with a particular shout out to Annette, EPA, the other sponsors. Um, I want to thank the medical school the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health, headed by Bob Wright, for their leadership in having hosted this thing, their continuing support, going back to the 1950s, to the days of Irving Salikoff and his landmark work in asbestos. Mount Sinai has been at the forefront of research, education, advocacy, prevention in environmental and occupational medicine for a long, long time, and, and this conference is just the latest manifestation of that. So a, a big shout out to the, to the institution and to the department. Um, I always think that these concluding, first of all, con thanks to all of you for being here and, and to the relatively small group of the faithful that are here at um, quarter past two on the last day of a four-day meeting. This is a, a testimony to your either your perseverance or the fact that you had an unchangeable airline ticket. I'm not sure which, so, so that's, that's good. So um, 
these, these, concluding con these concluding sessions of a conference, in my mind, have a couple of purposes. The, the first, as Roberta just said, is to, out of the four days of presentations, the many thousands of words that have been spoken at the podium, to tease out a few thoughts. What are the, what are the big themes? And then how do you weave those, those threads together to make an argument to NIEHS, to EPA, to NIOSH, to other funding agencies that there are specific topics within the field of manganese uh, toxicology and epidemiology th uh, that they should be funding. There's clearly unmet needs, despite all the knowledge that has grown over the past 25, 50 years about manganese. There's important stuff we don't know, and there most certainly are important areas for prevention, and in some cases, new scientific knowledge is going to, <coughs> is going to support and, and advance prevention. So I would challenge each of the, um, the, the uh, session chairs who are going to be coming forward in a few minutes and making their brief presentations to either now in your verbal comments or in any written notes that you send in to Roberto afterwards, please highlight future needs for either research or prevention or other forms of interventions. It's very important that you help us by, by highlighting this stuff because none of you knows the details of this material as, as well as you do. You're the, you're the folks that are doing the research, not certainly not me. Um, but you can help us to put, to put something together. The, the advocacy piece of these kind of meetings is important. Roberto hosted a meeting on manganese in Brescia in Italy in 2006? Oh yeah, it was uh, uh, manganese, mercury, and lead actually. Yeah, right. 2006. Some, some, some of you are there. One of the things that we did at that meeting, and Joe Graziano gets a lot of the credit, was it, that, it had to do with the fact that at that time, in 2006, there was a global push on, supported by the chemical industry, to market this noxious product, MMT, for insertion into gasoline supplies around the world. Lead had been out of gasoline. The companies that used to make tetraethyl lead were no longer profiting from the sale of that toxic product, but they had come up with a, a new uh, scheme, and that was to produce the MMT as an octane enhancer to go into gasoline, and they were aggressively marketing that around the world at the time. And we got the, the participants in that 2006 Brescia conference together, we produced the Brescia State, what was it called? The Declaration of Brescia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a ver and the highlight of that de declaration was a, a, a call for the global cessation of manufacture and use of MMT. I know it hasn't been a complete success. Uh, some of the stuff is still being sold, but I suspect that we've saved a lot of people around the world from manganese toxicity by virtue of, of that action. I, and we, Roberto and I have talked in the corridors during this meeting to ask ourselves if there was need for a similar declaration this time around. We came to the conclusion probably not, but if some of you feel otherwise, this is a good time to pipe up because we can certainly feel there is such need. We can produce something over the next few weeks with your help and, and get it out. And I'm sure we can talk to Joan about seeing if she'd be interested in publishing it in the journal. So those are the two purposes of this last meeting. Pull, pull, pull together the science and come up with some research needs that we can use to inform the funding agencies, and then secondly, think about directions for disease prevention. So, back to you. So okay. good. Uh, now, uh, the microphone is there uh, and there, <laughs> right? So I would like to ask you, the chair of the sessions, and, who, and whoever wants to address anything, or we just wrap it up now because we are all, I think we are all tired. Uh, I, I just throw something in, in here. I, I, I have a feeling that we have discussed about manganese in general, right? But manganese in reality is a lot of different things, a lot of different species. And uh, so the speciation and the, sol and the fractionation of solubility is an important uh, part of this uh, conversation. And uh, I haven't seen much about this. And uh, to me, that is one of the most important, one of the most important points that should be developed further in terms of understanding uh, the, the, the toxicity and, uh, and uh, of the different species more to understand uh, actually 
uh, better uh, what to consider in terms of uh, biomarkers and, and try to understand the, uh, the health outcomes better. So I think this is my particular uh, point that, that I, I would like to underline. Also, a lot of uh, points were raised about the fact that, uh, of course, but this is a general conversation and it's going to be very difficult to approach in, in the context of manganese. It's not, it's not only a problem for manganese and it's related to the fact we've heard several times uh, we consider manganese, but we know it's not only manganese, there's copper, zinc, uh, lead, and many other elements that interplay, and uh, actually mm, we focus one on them one by one, which is important because that's what we have to do, I think, first, but we have to consider constantly that there's a problem also of uh, mixed exposure and other elements that we have to analyze, and we have to analyze not only in our analytical method, but also with the uh, statistical models that, uh, that should consider this. And, uh, and another one last point that I want to make is about, uh, we, we, we just talked about hair manganese and, uh, and the problems that we have with different methods and different te uh, techniques in terms of, uh, of preparing the samples, avoiding the external con contamination. So I think that we are here and uh, we work on these issues together and uh, actually it would be a very nice idea if we can come up with some sort of uh, understanding and, uh, and, uh, identify, uh, and we sort of we should identify some uh, uh, reference uh, methodology and so therefore we uh, increase the possibility to compare all the different studies in a better way. This is just one, one point here that I heard today, and I think it's important because hair manga is, I mean, it's being used by, by many researchers in the Yeti studies, and I think that uh, what we understood about the, the, the potential, the differences, etc., this is going to be an important point. Uh, Don. I just wanted to echo what you just said, Roberto, but also maybe expand a little bit, um, and here's an example. I think more broadly, the, the biomarker challenge remains, um, you know, but I think we've made progress over the past decade or so in understanding what measures that can be made in, a, in an individual to reflect either exposure or risk for some health effects, but clearly there's a, a long way to go, and the hair is a good example of that. And I think the, in the case of the hair, you know, the, it, it, uh, I understand now that it may be used uh, in risk assessment and so on, but there honestly is way too little understood about how hair or any kind of a biological tissue really reflects the exposure in an integrated fashion, which is what we want to know. And I think, I don't know if Harry's still here, but Harry made a suggestion of trying to relate uh, plasma metal or manganese levels to hair. Now, of course, you know, in a perfect world we do that, but we can't put an individual in a metabolic unit for, uh, for the two or three months it might take to repeatedly evaluate relationships between plasma and hair. So there needs to be other approaches, but that kind of thing needs to be done in the context of different exposure scenarios. Um, and so I think until that's done, it'll be very speculative in understanding how it re really reflects ex an exposure and, uh, and may help predict a potential health effect. Yeah, Harry's still here. Oh, Harry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you over there, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for referring to this. Within five minutes, I must leave with, uh, with <laughs> Thomas. And it, certainly, one point, one thing that should be uh, that needs uh, more research and is the environmental exposure to manganese. Uh, to my knowledge, it, in, in uh, 20 years ago, MMT was a big issue, but we haven't seen any 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 paper, any contribution uh, dealing with MMT. Uh, and uh, the, the, the manganese in the, uh, uh, in the air, in urban, urban air in the States, uh, is nearly the same level as uh, the RFC of uh, uh, EPA, so 0 0.05 micrograms per cubic meter. So that is, that is pretty good. And uh, since we have the... Uh, uh, PBBK models that show that uh, uh, when uh, the uh, air concentration of manganese uh, respirable then is lower than 10 micrograms per cubic meter, there is no uh, uh, significant accumulation of manganese into, into the critical organs. 
so that is that is one point that I, I, I would stress. Uh, that's and another one is that the uh, neuropsychological uh, findings in the in those environmental studies. I participated in those and I, I was thrilled with it. But since I am three years uh, involved with uh, studies on uh, pure uh, air pollution, we did also the same neuropsychological test in, in areas where there is no manganese and we see the same neuropsychological effects. So my suggestion is that those uh, environmental studies done uh, in, with manganese uh, in here in the States and in, in, in in uh, South America, uh, that those uh, would take into account the uh, particul particulate matter concentration as a confounding into the uh, uh, to, to sort out whether it is due to manganese or whether it's uh, or the contribution of manganese and the contribution of uh, the uh, particulate matter, because it is known that it goes into the brain, gives inflammation, and recently uh, there was a paper in Lancet showing. Uh, magnetic particles in the brain. So, so that is definitely a, a, a pathway uh, that is not uh, explored or is not taken up in the manganese uh, uh, environmental studies. Thank you. And now it's time to go, I think. Thank you, thank you Roberto for Andreno and Carla for having organized this. Uh, it was well needed. Uh, I think it has been a great success and as one of the oldest people here, uh, I am so proud of the young people and all of the presentations that were made here. And I feel now I can really, really retire. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> However, um, I think that the questions that were raised here are such important questions and we also now know much more about who is doing what. And I think that for the different issues that we're raising, like the issue that Harry talked about of, uh, of my plasma manganese or serum manganese and hair, well, you know who's working on it. The idea is to ask them, if, would it be possible to incorporate this into their studies? Would it be possible to add on? Would it be possible for somebody to contribute something to somebody else's studies? And one of the nice things is that what we did see is that a lot of groups are collaborating together in order to come up with different information. And that is different from the way it was certainly 18 years ago. And uh, that is a very positive uh, thing, and I think that we should build on it as much as we can. Um, we know that there are cohort studies that could, uh, that could be used to look at some of the issues that we're, we're discussing. Uh, Don can take the lead in uh, intercalibrating labs. <laughs> Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just features. call on each other and use the website that they have set up to ask these questions. And, I mean, there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of things that are still unanswered. Um, if we're going to make declarations, I would like to see a declaration as well with respect to regulating manganese and water. Uh, because I think throughout the world, the United States and Canada included, there are many areas where there are high levels of manganese in water. There are no guidelines. It's not even an obligatory, uh, one doesn't even have to uh, measure it in, most, in water in most places. The World Health Organization has uh, not even included it this year in their guidelines. It's only a secondary guideline in, um, uh, in the United States. Canada, probably because we are Canadians and the studies were done in Canada, is uh, now uh, revising their guidelines. They had a public... Uh, but I think that as scientists work on manganese, that we... Uh, not asking at this point to set a limit. 
though Canada is proposing one, but uh, at least to say that we do need the World Health Organization to uh, reset limits for manganese in drinking water. And I, for one, learned here from David Dorman as to why one does see effects of manganese from drinking water, even though the concentrations are so much less than what they are in food. So thank you, David. Before you give up the microphone, can you draft a few paragraphs that encapsulate what you just said towards the declaration? Sure. I mean, like, between now and... Between now and the time your plane takes off. No, over, over, <laughs> over, 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 the, over the next week, but while it's fresh. Don't, yep. let, it, don't, let, don't, it get, don't yep. let it get stale. What, no. about, what about MMT? Do we, have, do we have global data on the use of MMT? Does anybody have, have global? I, I will give this to somebody who has. Yeah. In the Pacific Rim. Is Canada still using it? Hi, uh, I'm Athena from Afton Chemical Corporation. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do have global data on MMT use. It is not used in Canada, the U.S., or the EU. Um, the only place it is it is used at this point really have no other choices for octane levels, but it. Uh, no, uh, potentially South Africa, although not right now. Um, Venezuela, it is no longer used in China. We are looking at Algeria. Algeria is still completely on lead. <laughs> For what? For MMT? We don't, I mean... Most places, <laughs> most places now have the ability to increase octane by the refinery process. So, it's or ethanol. Yeah. Ethanol. Yeah. So I, I want to commend uh, Roberto as well uh, for for putting the conference uh, and everybody who. Helped him put it together. Bye, Harry. Have a safe flight. Uh, a couple comments. I, I think what we need to look back in the mirror, and I think a lot has been done since 1999 or oh, yeah. 1907 when Absolutely. we had the last conference. Uh, so, you know, everybody who's in the room here is responsible for that. Uh, and, and I think it has really helped a lot in terms of coming up with a risk assessment to MMT and, and just manganese in, in general. Uh, you know, I'm a basic scientist, so uh, obviously I, I, I pitch in for continued, uh, you know, studies on manganese handling in, in different cells, distribution of manganese, uh, imaging manganese, and so forth. But, you know, since our ultimate responsibility is human health, one, one thing that I still think is missing from a lot of the analysis, and now we have the data for that, or we're starting to have the data, and maybe one of the good examples was in this morning's session when uh, Karine talked about it. I, I think, you know, when people are looking at pharmacokinetics and, and manganese handling in different tissues, there's really no attention given to, to the genetics. And th there is information now about different transporters, whether it's importers such as DMT1, SLC3810, and you know, I, th I think when people are doing the epidemiology, it's going to be more and more important that the people that they look at are, you know, being genotyped at the same time. So, and, and not just one transporter or two transporter. And, and I know it gets more expensive the more genes you're starting to look at, but I, I think we're going to get a much better information about manganese and how it's being handled if we know more about the exposures, which were mentioned, uh, ex biomarkers of exposure, hair, toenails, whatever it ends up being, and then combining that with, you know, how individuals might be handling the, the manganese. Because, you know, you, you might have mutations in SLC3810, which might be compensating by, 
you know, another mutation in a DMT1. And uh, unless you do a whole battery of genes, you really don't know, you know, you don't have the final answer. So I'll shut up here. So, Roberto, thank you, and, and Joni. Um, it, it was a great meeting from, from the perspective of new information and diversity. Um, I was at the uh, meeting tw uh, 19 years ago, um, and really things have changed dramatically. I just want to make a comment because I have to leave, and I think one of the, one of the new types of uh, knowledge that we have compared to even 10 years ago is these uh, mutations in, in these transporters. And I think the, the new animal models that are being developed are going to be extremely important to understand pathophysiology uh, and, and taking into consideration uh, aging because um, even though the SLC 3810 uh, knockouts are, don't survive, the SLC 39A14 knockouts actually su survive until they're very old, and they have elevated manganese levels in the brain. So this is another model that will be able to provide, you know, a, a greater understanding about mechanisms and physiology much quicker than, than human studies, obviously, uh, or primate studies for that matter. So um, I think there's, there's a, a new avenues to, to get a greater understanding of the totality of the pathophysiology of manganese. And so I want to thank you for uh, inviting me, and, and it's, it was wonderful. Thanks. And I understand that you're going you're gonna <laughs> yeah, so to host the next So Roberto <laughs> is pitching uh, Miami in the wintertime for years from now. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so can I just comment? So... Um, Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I'm Will Boys, and as you know, I work at EPA, and I was involved in a lot of our negotiations with the Ethel Corporation and now Afton. And I'd just like to say that I think, you know, after the lawyers finished fighting it out, that when the scientists started talking between the agency and the um, consultants to Ethel and Afton, these are, you know, Mel Anderson and David Dorman and Harvey Cool. And we had an, a strong team at EPA that came to the table. It was Linda Birnbaum at that time and uh, Fred Miller and other people that were really strong <coughs> in the science of it. When we started to talk about what types of studies needed to be done to resolve the issues, we really began to close this gap that had been really uh, tense and, uh, and, and toxic for a long time. And since that time, I think, through this 211B cooperative uh, program, we have really generated a unique set of data on the pharmacokinetics of manganese that was not possible through any other mechanism. And so I actually give them credit for continuing to fund that research, even after EPA has stopped requiring them to do that. They're funding the drinking water studies that Dave Dorman did that are going to fund this model that I think is going to be really important in understanding how the drinking water pharmacokinetics could possibly be associated with some of these effects that Donna and others are reporting. So I think one of the things in my perspective that has changed tremendously since the last meeting is that there's much less polarization in the manganese scientific community and it's a much more cooperative and collaborative arrangement now and I think since then we've really been able to put tremendous advances into the scientific status of what we can understand about this, and that will be translated someday into the risk assessments. The other point I was going to make to change topics is that from the session that Christoph and I uh, chaired, it seemed to me that at EPA where I work, but it also at a number of other agencies, the risk values for occupational and environmental exposure to manganese are really dated 20 years or more ago, and we've learned an awful lot since then. So what I would really like to see is that there's a concerted effort to update these values and incorporate the modern modeling as well as a lot of the information that we've learned about the cognitive and frontal cortex effects in addition to the motor effects of manganese.
Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Uh, there was Karin. Yeah, um, just um, I think that one thing that came up um, during the second day of the conference, or the third day, actually is that it's not clear yet how the early life exposure, how critical it is for later uh, toxicity, and if it's the early life or it's a lifelong exposure that Don showed. So, I mean, where is the wind of susceptibility? And this is very important also to, as a message for pregnant uh, women and also how to, how to raise the kids. So, and there could be also underlying, as we talked about, genetic differences because in some cord studies there's no effect on manganese and others you see very, very strong where is actually the threshold and could there be susceptibility factors. So I think there is still a lot to do there um, to suggest for, for funding. That, that also has implications for occupational exposure limits. By, by analogy with lead, one of the things we learned a long time ago, of course, about lead is that it moves right across the placenta. Um, and therefore, if a woman uh, is pregnant or about to become pregnant and she's working in a battery factory and she's exposed to lead, whatever gets into her body gets into the body and thence the brain of her fetus. And so there was a whole big debate, which is still, I, in my mind, unresolved about whether the occupational standard should be lowered to a point where the, the fetus of a pregnant woman worker is protected. And we're not there yet. The, the, the occupational lead standard is still not sufficient to achieve that goal. And at least in Sweden, we have many new female yeah. welders coming. So they, I mean, doing yeah. also the work where you have uh, increased manganese exposure. So we get this question rather often. Yeah. So it's important, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jacques, I think. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, I, I was very happy to attend this meeting. I learned a lot of things, uh, some coming to, to, uh, to uh, challenging some of my uh, problems linked with air pollution, Parkinson's disease, and so on. But uh, I'm still uh, MD, and uh, as MD, I have one question. And now, what are we doing? What are we able to bring to the community? It means, first, we have to uh, increase uh, prevention. Second, we have to propose to patients exposed to, to uh, manganese and having manganese, we have to propose the treatments or, in, uh, or for young people. And if we know that something could happen, the other question is, what can we do? Is it possible to reverse? some of the genetic, you know, the epigenetic mechanism. I think it's very important to have all these issues when you will organize the next one. The, the therapeutic issue is uh, very important. If you want to have access to patients, we have not, it's not, the only access is not to say, we are looking uh, on your deeds, we will, we are interested, and the people uh, uh, have always the same question. How can we treat? What can you do for me? And I think it's very important to, to look at this point. Yeah. Brad and Carla. So if I were to summarize I, uh, this meeting, I would say we, we, we saw a bit of the past, the present, and the future. You started with the past with a really you know, amazing uh, historical review of manganism, and then went, you know, we've, we saw presentations, a number of presentations about the latest data that is coming out in various areas that I think can obviously very timely and, and, um, and I think will be influential work in it. We also had several presentations that, that, this, that sort of outlined the future of where we're going and I think we probably in many ways need a bit more of that. So the, you know, Harry for example referred to the need for environmental studies and you know, Joel talked about a study we're doing and there are lots of examples of studies like that that were that, that are sort of, we, we heard a little bit about the new, the latest work that's the work that people are just starting now and and the reason I bring that up is I think that one of the values of this meeting to me and I think to many others is is, is you had a really strong emphasis on networking and, and collaboration and I think that over time many of us have started to collaborate together and so we have this you know we we're no longer working in isolation you know 
a Mickey Eschner working on worms will be collaborating with somebody doing human work. And I think that those sorts of interactions that you create and foster in these meetings is, is really the, 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 the legacy of a meeting like this because the, the science will really go forward much more strongly with those sorts of collaborations. So I sort of commend you for having the vision when you, when you design the, the conference. I think one of the things in going forward that would help is, and it, I don't know if it's possible in the context of what you're thinking about with, um, with written documents, but you know there there may well be collaborations that that could be fostered still from beyond this meeting if people really could go could figure out who's doing. I don't think we really covered. You know, what are what are, the, what, are what are you most excited about? What are you, where are you going with your work? Because those sorts of collaborations can easily come out of this meeting, and so the next time you have this in five, ten years, you know, if, if we can if we can have formed new collaborations that that were built off of the work that that we're that we're planning on doing, I think that would really be uh, an important contribution to the meeting as well. Christoph. I uh, just have to say thank you, Roberto, again for organizing that meeting. Um, from our session, uh, there was uh, some good news and some open questions, let's say. Um, I think that with respect to the occupational situation, there have been a lot of studies, some studies uh, from the 90s, from, from Hari, that are of that good quality that you could use and that were a good uh, point of departure um, to provide a health-based um, OEL. Other, like OSHA uh, institutions, they did not adopt that due to um, legislation problems. Um, but what we don't have is we have not an evidence-based um, uh, occupation exposure limit because there are so many uh, aspects lacking. One is gender. So we have welder studies and we have the um, the miners and smelters, but there were almost no females in that. When, when we did the meta-analysis several years ago and we got this um, individual participant pay, uh, um, uh, data, we had to exclude women because there were only a few. So what we really need, and Karen was talking about the Swedish welders, we need to have a gender stratification also for the OELs um, because we learned that there is so much differences with respect to the background that was and Haynes and other studies already shown um, that, that we need to get evidence about how does this important factor um, modulate the fact that we have. The second thing was at least in our session and Donna addressed it already drinking water I cannot understand that after the discoveries from Mickey with this uh, um, high content of manganese uh, in parental nutrition, um, there, there is no concern in drinking water. So that is completely unregulated. Um, and that is something that also needs to be taken into account that, um, or needs to be addressed in the near future that WHO needs to put it back on the list because we, we know it is essential, yes, but at certain levels it's a neurotoxin. And even so we cannot provide a reference value because of the data gap. It needs to be, it needs to have the header tag. And I have the feeling that there is no tag right now. Um, what is also important the interaction between basic science regulators and neuroscientists and all these people, they must be strengthened because only with that, so with the knowledge from Thomas Imaging data about these cholinergic interneurons, I can go to the literature and talk to other neuroscientists and ask about how could we measure that in, on EEG level, was behavioral task, uh, or with some, some additional um, parameters that we don't have in mind now. We can go and have some more concrete questions that we can address to other disciplines. So, Nikki mentioned we brought in genetics because we ask some specific question about how is manganese imported and exported from the cells. Uh, and, and with that collaboration that started here and with a little bit of kind of 
coordinated conversation and interaction, um, we might achieve more goals at the next conference. Bob? So one of the things that I found um, really fascinating is among children, it's clear that manganese concentrations are much higher in blood. At the same time, in all the population studies, there's a fairly consistent finding that subclinical manganese deficiency is toxic. So despite having much higher blood levels, they actually have evidence of deficiency. Uh, and I really would like to see some basic science addressing this question, because I, I think it's going to be difficult to understand manganese toxicity if we don't understand what is a sufficient state and what is a deficient state, because I think it's pretty clear from the data that deficiency exists. It's still ill-defined, but we can seem to measure that signal repeatedly in many different populations. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much for putting this together. I'm a postdoc. I've only been in neurotox for about three years. I'm a neuroscientist. I was a physical therapist first. I've been studying Parkinson's probably since I was 15 years old. So this is just a, such a fascinating field to be in now and to be part of your group now. I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit. I think the drinking water issue is a huge concern. Um, I was speaking earlier. Um, with a couple of different individuals that I was at a Society for Neuroscience conference three years ago. Somebody approached me. One person was from Canada um, asking me, because she said that she was concerned about the drinking water. I, it wasn't you, what, was it? That may be who that, okay. And she approached, came to my poster. Here I am at Society for Neuroscience with 40,000 people. And somebody found, so it was just a really interesting collaboration at, or she came to ask me a little bit more about it. And she emailed me and I sent her my poster because she said they were trying to get the levels to get um, a cutoff. I, sorry if I'm not using the proper language. I'm still a little bit new to this, but to, for the drinking water because they feel like it's a concern. So I thought that was very interesting. And she said here in the United States, you guys don't have that, you know, and I was like, oh, wow. And then about two days later, somebody came and spoke to me about um, in West Virginia, they are having a horrible problem with their drinking water, and there's a whole group of individuals right now who are in the middle of a lawsuit who are dealing with their drinking water, and they are showing motor symptoms. Um, they just measured the levels, and there's nothing. And I, th and I talked to Tomas about it, and he said, well, it's probably because he talked to some of the lawyers. They stopped drinking the water. But in court, now they're saying, oh, you can't, we're not convinced it's manganese because now you don't have manganese blood levels, hair, whatever. But so it's, it's something that, you know, I don't really know where to go from. Where, where do I go from there? This, these people are emailing us all the time, asking us for help, but obviously I'm not the expert in this, and, you know, they, they need some help. So I reached out, and now I have some information from the EPA, um, and it's in Lincoln County, West Virginia, and if anybody, I, I'm sorry to take the, you know, I don't mean to get off track, but I just think it's a very important question, and, and how do we go from there, and how do, for me, um, as a neuroscientist coming into this, how do we help people when we hear about these situations, you know, and now I feel like I've learned a lot more about how we can maybe address and work together and collaborate. As Brad was saying, we need to collaborate. We all need to kind of come together and get on the same page. So I just, if you want to talk after, we can talk. I have it in an email. Um, I don't remember off the top of my hand. Um, and Tomas probably knows, but he had to go, so. It was pretty high from what he told me. He said it was, it was really high. So. Mickey, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, it was first. Sorry. Uh, I'm glad that Roberto mentioned this solubility issue. Uh, at the National Institute of Occupational Health in Norway, uh, we were working uh, with uh, manganese solubility, bioaccessibility, and uh, speciation for more than 15 years now, and I'm sure that there are others uh, who are uh, working with this. Uh, I know, for example, Nyos uh, in Morgantown. 
and I think uh, this is a very important uh, issue, but, but there are other, other things uh, which could be important uh, in the better estimation of, of the uh, dose. Uh, thinking, first of all, about uh, the lung deposition, and there uh, the different uh, particle deposition models uh, and the particle size distribution da data uh, are very essential. So I think uh, this was my contribution here. <laughs> Mickey? Um, going back to the, the water issue, uh, I, I think if you need to get actually the manganese levels in you know, your water, if you're fortunate enough to have water that's distributed by your municipality, you can get it. But the problem is much bigger because about, you know, I don't, I don't know the exact percentage in the U.S., for example, of people that don't get municipal water. And of those people, 6% get water that has actually more than 300 micrograms per liter. And those are levels that have been shown to be associated with neurocognitive deficits by some of the studies conducted by uh, Wasserman and, and Joe Graziano. So, you know, 6% of the U.S. population is a fairly large number, and I think if you go globally, uh, you will come with millions of people that are consuming manganese levels, which are higher than those that have been shown to have neurocognitive function in children. So, I, I know the, the IOM uh, a few years ago has gone and determined safe water levels. I, they have a special term for that. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but... It's been done for a copper, it's been done for some, some other metals. So, you know, maybe if there's consensus here, one should call upon the IOM and ask them to come with a reference level for manganese as well. Is that a, is that a standing committee, Mickey, or is that a one side? No, it's, uh, I was on the copper one in, in water. It was about 10 years ago. It's not. It's just ad hoc members that are yeah. called in going to show once again that water from private wells is the most dangerous water. The water from wells, and it probably has to do, as we've seen in some of the presentations, with the distribution of manganese in soil. Uh, so there are probably tremendous levels, tremendous differences in terms of the water levels, but this is something that's completely unregulated, mm -hmm. and, and it's a large size of the U.S. population, and, and I assume in developing countries it's probably even worse. Okay, before we, we, we finish, I, I would like to ask something to you, Annette, because uh, <laughs> you, you are a big star here, and, and I'm so happy you came, and uh, we are all happy that you were here. I mean, I, I'm just, uh, uh, based on your, on your expertise, you have seen so much. Uh, I mean, how do you see, I mean, this is great. I mean, this, is, this conversation is actually, I believe, it's a, it's a major trend. I mean, we're talking, we've been talking about collaboration, and to me, one of the most important collaboration of, of all is basic scientists and, 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 and human scientists, because that to me is kind of a crucial collaboration in, in so many things. But, and occupational. Well, occupational environmental, you know, of course, but, but the basic sciences and the human, that, that's to me a fundamental need, because uh, when we design something, I have a pleasure to work with Don, and so, and, and that's a good example for me to back and forth, I see something, and, and, and he, and with, and, and with Bob too, I mean, we have this great resource of, of exchanging ideas very quickly, you see something, that's so, all, but, but I'm curious, uh, uh, from your perspective, how could we do better, how could we uh, improve this, because uh, definitely we need also to optimize what we're doing, I mean, I, I heard uh, Will Boyce saying that 11 years of wasted time in, in, in litigation. That's something that we need to avoid because that's time, resources, and a lot of, uh, for what? In the end, lawyers, okay, that's, put the, stay away with the lawyers. I tell you, I, 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 we have the unions here. I think we all agree with this. We don't want to have lawyers involved too, too much or at all <laughs> into our Thing. So I, I think it's important for us to, to, to keep the conversation in a collaborative way, try to avoid waste of time and effort. But, but just, a, just your opinion, how could we, can we improve the, the, the collaboration in, in terms of uh, 
Well, but collaboration optimizing this. is now the operative word at NIH, even though it is difficult to review applications that are run the gamut. Uh, but I think you have to keep uh, your lines open to the Institute and convince them that this is extremely important. And uh, I, you have the human study and with collaborators who are doing more mechanistic, et cetera. And, and then you're collaborating with the Marietta people as well. And these are things that are really sought after now. As I said, the difficulty is when you put in an application with all of these pieces in it, getting it well reviewed is difficult. So uh, NIEHS has not renewed um, um, uh, what's the expression we used? Um, independent initiation of uh, program projects. They, and, and I think that's a big mistake, and I wish it were not true. But they do do targeted program projects. And what you have to convince them is that this is important for these reasons. And uh, we would get our what we were interested in funding really from you people. I mean, we didn't make it up out of whole cloth. So you really have to convince the Institute that this is important and, and you, know, you have an ear to Linda Birnbaum, Gwen Coleman, I mean, I'm going through the extramural program, but you've got to keep those lines open and convince them that this just has to be done. This is because manganese is not one of the top priorities, you think? No, I don't, I don't, I, it's just that, you know, there are fads in science, unfortunately, and there are sexy technologies mm -hmm. in all of this. And so the institute gets caught up in this. The extramural program gets caught up with this. But, and then of course this, that there's NIOSH, which does not have the funding that NIH does by any means, but is used as why aren't they interested? But you really have got to get through to the people at NIHS, et cetera, and convince them that these things have got to be supported. And, and, we, and when you say this, I, 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 I think I understand that it's better that, that we use a network of collaborative network, not, not of the individual, right. individual conversation, of course, happen, right. but I, you think it's important yes. to use the strength of, 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 uh, of a right. networking of collaboration. I think that what you generate here, as far as what the future needs are, would be very useful to sharing. And that's, there's not an easy line. Money is tight. Uh, you know, uh, but this is important. One of the things we've learned, and, and Bill echoed this with EPA, uh, we can't do 30 years of research to prove that something shouldn't have been out there to begin with. Yeah, that's true. I, it's just, yeah. it's you, just made, you made that point last night. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I don't want to see that happen with manganese. Uh, it, it, you've got to convince them that the research is important and it collectively. So I would share whatever you generate here with the Institute. Okay. okay? Good. Thank you very much, Annette. Thank you. Uh, I think we can close here.